Good morning. Good morning. Let's start this morning worshiping the Lord.
Acts 12.11 says this. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without, without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. And I'd like to preach for a while this morning for the subject, without a doubt. Father, we thank you for this time together this morning. Lord, I pray that you would help me to be active in teaching your word, Lord, that we would all be built up, nourished, and strengthened. God, your, your own word calls, calls it meat. This is meat for us, Lord, if we'll take it in and chew on it. <coughs> It'll nourish us and make us strong. And Lord, we pray that today that is exactly what it will accomplish. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm skipping <laughs> chapter 11 because a lot of it is just a recap of what we did last week in chapter 10 and, and going on and looking at chapter 12. And it struck me, I was reading um, an article recently uh, that was published by the Chuck Colson Center. How many of you know who Chuck Colson is? Chuck Colson was a guy that went to prison over Watergate <laughs> and uh, became a Christian while in uh, prison and really did amazing work for the kingdom and his in this center to, to this day his center still does uh, just a brilliant brilliant man um, authored many many books um, but anyways I was reading this article from from the Chuck Colson Center and it says during a sit down interview with Pastor Tim Keller just before Christmas New York Times columnist Nicholas Kristoff suggested that Christianity can survive without the virgin birth or resurrection. He said this, I deeply admire Jesus and his message, he said, but I'm also skeptical of themes that have been integral to Christianity, the virgin birth, the resurrection, the miracles, and so on. Are these really the essential to, to the Christian faith? Isn't it possible to be a Christian without embracing them? Keller replied that you cannot remove uh, Jesus' miraculous entry into the world or his miraculous return to life without destabilizing the whole of Christianity. A religion cannot be whatever you desire it to be. And today I want to take a look at chapter 12 because I think it's very important to understand the miraculous as an essential part of Christianity. And I use this opening passage in verse 11, because I love how Peter says, without a doubt, and then he references a miraculous event. Okay, let me just pause quickly, if I can. What, what this tells you, when you read a statement like this, and, and many of you may know the name Nicholas Kristof, he's a very popular uh, you know, journalist with the New York Times. Um, he totally misses the point of the, uh, of the virgin birth. I, I spoke at uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes this past week in, at Delphi Jefferson, and it was great. You know what? Pray for, pray for Judy. Pray for those folks, uh, all the teachers out there doing this on our high school campuses or running organizations like this. She had 33 kids at Delphi Jefferson I had for uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, and I spoke about the importance of the virgin birth. The key of the virgin birth, yes, is it miraculous and does that show us God? Yes, but the key of the virgin birth is what? I've talked about this here before. Do you remember? Pardon me? Born without sin. Jesus could not be the product of natural procreation or he will, because what? All seed produces after its own kind. Every human being since Adam sinned. Has been born sinful, right? Psalm 51 5 says that we are sinful at conception, sinful while in our mother's womb. Even before I've ever done anything, I'm already sinful because we're the product of fallen seed. If Jesus had been born of natural conception, then he would have been sinful and he would have not have been a sufficient sacrifice to redeem mankind. That's the thing. It's not just that it's simply miraculous. So um, those things are really important to believe. And I'm just going to say this about the miraculous. Think about this as I go through this. People who believe in the miraculous or believe that it's possible will see more miracles. If you don't believe in them, you won't see them. If you believe in it, you'll recognize when God is at work and doing the supernatural. So it's important to believe that God, in fact, really does the miraculous. You cannot remove the miraculous from Christianity and still have it be Christianity. So the answer to Nicholas Kristof is no, you cannot remove those things and still have 
Christianity, certainly the virgin birth, and for that matter, the resurrection, because that's where our new life comes from. If you miss those two things and don't believe them, you don't have Christianity. That should be crystal clear to every person that believes that Jesus is God's son come to redeem the world. So let's go back and let's look and start in Acts chapter 12, verse 1. Acts 12, 1. And we're going to do some historical setup here to help understand this. Acts 12, 1, reading through verse 4. It says, It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handed him over to be guarded by four guards of four, of four, soldiers, four squads I'm sorry, of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So let me put this in a little bit of historical context to understand what's taking place here. The Herod that's mentioned here in, in Acts chapter 12 as a, as a uh, persecutor of James and John, he, now Herod, these are <coughs> titles, okay? He is Herod Agrippa I. That's who this is referring to. He was the grandson of Herod the Great and was educated in Rome. He supported Caligula as the successor to Tiberius and was uh, imprisoned as a result. This is under the Romans, okay? That, that, those are Romans. When Caligula became emperor, Herod Agrippa was released and was given the title of king. Herod Agrippa was the key figure in persuading Caligula to rescind his order to place an image of himself in the temple. So we have here, again, I've talked about this a few times in the past, the interaction between um, uh, the Jewish leaders, the Jewish king, Herod, and the Roman king or Caesar. Here we have Caligula and Tiberius, and we're talking about Caligula now. So th this is interacting, okay? Um, between these, between these two kings. Herod was a king to the Jews, but in the sense of the Romans, obviously he's not a king. Um, <clears throat> so Herod Agrippa had talked Caligula out of setting this bust of himself up to be worshipped in the temple. And he's like, hey, that'd be a bad idea. Okay, don't do that. Because of this, and the fact that he followed Jewish law very strictly, the Pharisees loved him. So they loved, they loved Herod, this Herod, King Herod I, because he, he followed the law, the Jewish law. James and John would have supported Peter's trip to Cornelius' home, his conversation and filling with the Holy Spirit. This, of course, angered the Pharisees. In keeping, uh, in, keeping in the Pharisees' good graces, King Herod and James or had James killed and was going to do the same to Peter because he saw how much it pleased the Jews. So the, the, I want to, I, I state all this, this is history, okay? This, this is not disputed. These events are, are recorded as a part of history. So I wanted to read that to make sure I got all this, but let me re-summarize that if I can. So you have King Herod. Okay, Agrippa the first, that's who's in power when all this is taking place that I'm reading about in Acts chapter 12. Why is he arresting these people? Because what? They are, they are evangelizing Gentiles, and they're doing things and interacting with the Gentiles in a way that the Jewish law would say not to. And the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, loved King Herod, Agrippa the first, because he followed the Jewish law very strictly. So, because he did, he had James killed and had Peter arrested and would have had him executed most likely as well. So, in the setting of this is where we see Peter in jail. That's why, that's why he is in jail, okay? And this is, what, this is where this is headed if God does not miraculously intervene. Peter will most likely be executed. So we go on in chapter starting in verse 5 in Acts 12. It says, So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying for God for him. 
The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrist. So there's two things here that I want to point out. The first thing is, is that the church was doing what? They were praying. They were praying to God to do what? Now, at this point, we see the miraculous take place where an angel comes and uh, you know wakes Peter up. He stands up. The chains fall off. That seems to be pretty supernatural. Amen? <coughs> it's critical to this. And as Peter said in our opening passage, without a doubt, God did this. But... The church is praying. What are they praying for? What? what it says, he, what? Uh, they're there, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. What, what would we say they were praying for? To release him, but for him to be released would have to be a, a miracle. So the New Testament church, they are praying specifically for a miracle would take place because however it happens, whether it's angels or Herod the Pharisees changed their mind about prosecuting him or whatever, it's, it's going to be a miraculous <coughs> event for that to occur. Because as I just described, this was critical. The Pharisees and King Herod, they were all for this, man. You follow the law, you follow the law. There's no way Peter can go to Cornelius' house and preach the gospel to him, interact with him, eat food with him, and have them filled with the Holy Spirit and all these things, that just, that cannot be allowed as far as the way the Jews, the Jews saw it, Pharisees and King Herod. They're praying for a miracle. The second thing is, an angel of the Lord appears and he wakes Peter up and the chains fell off. I would call that a miracle. So the way that this is, they were praying for a miracle and a miracle happened. Now, like I said, when I pray, do miracles always happen when I pray? No. But I will tell you this, when miracles do happen, I'm much more likely to see them because I believe that God does miracles. If I don't believe them, I won't see them. I'm just curious. Can you, can you say you've seen a legit miracle? Just how many people do you think have seen a miracle? What is, and, and when it happens, you're like, what? Oh, that's pretty cool. I'd like to see more of that, right? It's pretty cool. We need to believe in miracles. And the angel. How many of you believe in angels? We saw, I mean, if you believe the Bible, you have to believe in angels. Um, we saw, we've been watching this video on, on Revelation uh, on Wednesday nights. And last week, there was a man who, as an actor, who portrayed an angel and uh, described about the tribulation. Um, and... Uh, all the, you know, pull the, the trumpets and the bowls and all these different judgments that come. And he, he man, he made a great angel. And, and uh, he had a great angel voice. And it reminded me, I've shared this before, um, I've never interacted with an angel as far as I personally know, but we did have an experience when I was a, a youth pastor in San Diego that Mr. Bill contacted the church. Her parents were members of the Satanic Church. She was trying to get out of it. She was 16 years old. Um, and uh, she called the church and wanted to come pick her up in downtown San Diego. Uh, myself and another youth guy, we did, we, we did is, well, Matt, Matt that was here a couple of years ago. Uh, um, we went down there and picked her up. Uh, and um, we asked how she knew about us, why she called our church. And she said, I ran into a guy on the street. His name was Mark. And he said he goes to your church every Wednesday night to your youth group. And we said, well, we did have a guy named Mark who was a, actually a, an adult helper with the youth. He was not one of the youth. And that's the only Mark we had. And uh, that Mark uh, was like about 5'8", thinning dark hair, uh, maybe 320, okay? If you can imagine being 5'8 and weigh 320. Um, and we said, so, I said, oh, oh, what did he look like? She said he was six foot two, blonde hair, blue eyes, really muscular, he was beautiful. And I'm like, that, that girl talked to an angel, man. 
Because we ain't got to that. And that certainly does not describe the mark when it comes to our youth group. And this is what made me think of when we saw this, this actor that was playing this part in, uh, in, in the, uh, the Revelation video that we've been watching on Wednesdays. I mean, so angels, I mean, when I read this, I think, yeah, okay. I mean, because I know those events have occurred. Those things have taken place. Let's go on. Verse 8, it says, Then the angel said to him, Put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea what the angel was doing and was, and was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went out through it. When they, talked, when they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent his angels and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. <laughs> so without a doubt, Peter comes to the ground and he realizes this is not a vision, this is not a dream, this is really happening. God has supernaturally, miraculously been. Now remember, I told you again, all of this, I'm going to preach a whole bunch here today to make one point. What do you think my one point is going to be? God does miracles. And we should be confident of that. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm blowing my own ending here. <clears throat> In this passage, we see the iron, go iron gate open by itself. Now, you could say we, we we see a lot of gates open by themselves today, right? You pull up to it, you trigger the little electric eye or whatever, and the gate <laughs> opens up. I got news for you, just in case you're, you're wondering. Drew, you're really young. That didn't happen in Jesus' time. They didn't have that technology yet back then, okay? So when the gate opened by itself, that means it was something that was supernatural that was happening. You cannot separate the miraculous from Christianity. Um, verse 11, it re again, it records that Peter is recognizing this is supernatural. God is directly intervening in this natural world, which is, I think, is kind of a way that I like to think of as something that's supernatural. It is something that would not normally happen as a part of the natural world. It's supernatural. If the miraculous is not a part of Christianity, and if God does not respond to the prayers of his people to do miraculous or to miraculously intervene in their lives, do we have this event recorded in Scripture? Why is this event recorded in Acts chapter 12? It's recording what? It's recording how God miraculously intervened in this situation. We may have it written that Herod had Peter arrested and put in jail, and then it would record what? Peter was tried and executed. <laughs> That's what this story would be. The story, and everybody probably in here is familiar with it before I started to read this, about Peter being in prison and the church being praying and the angels showed up and the chains fell off and he walked free and all that. It happened and it's recorded because it is a miracle. Let's go on in verse 12. When this had dawned on him, and he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also, uh, also called Mark, um, where many people had gathered and were praying. This is where the people were praying for him. Peter knocked on the outer entrance, and a servant girl named Rhoda came and answered the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed and ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. <laughs> you are out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be an angel. Now, this part, does anybody find the irony in this? They're praying for him to what? Get out of prison. He shows up and says, hey, I'm out of prison. And they go, no. 
Get out of here. Folks, if that's not us, I don't know what describes the, the, the church today. We say these things, we, 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 we want to believe for these things, but when they happen, it's like, it's so hard to imagine. And it is very exciting. I've shared this before, too. I won't go through all the details. I have been called by somebody to uh, want to know if I would do it. They had a, a wedding planner, had planned this whole uh, <coughs> wedding package, so you know how people do, to be married on the central coast of California, right there in that area where we live. It's gorgeous. You have the, you have the cliffs of California and the ocean and all this, you know, and they would do these things. And whoever the minister of this was did not, was not able to do the wedding for some reason. And I don't even have how they got my name. They were from the Fres they were from Fresno, and they wanted to know if because this whole this is a whole package. You know, they buy the wedding package, but then there's a minister that goes along with it. But the minister couldn't do it. Could I do the wedding? And I said, Yeah, I can do it, but only if I meet with you first. I don't do weddings with couples I have not had a chance to meet and counsel with. So they agreed and said that they'd be over on the central coast, which is several hours drive uh, from Fresno, and uh, and we would meet. And so uh, I can remember it was Kay's birthday, and we had a birthday party, and I left the party before it was kind of over, and I met him at an IHOP. And so we sat there, and we're, we're doing this thing, and I'm, you know, I always am sharing not only about the wedding and stuff and marriage, but I always point out, it's like, you're you're entering into a new phase of your life. And the neat thing is, this is a part of God's plan for you. God has a plan for you too. He has a plan for your life. And they just, it was, they were, they, they were competitive bodybuilders. I mean, and I was a lot bigger at the time and kind of into that thing, you know. And next thing I know, they're sitting in the booth across from me just weeping. And they, and they, I, I lead them in prayer to receive Jesus and all this. It was so amazing. And when I got up, I was so excited. Like Rhoda here, I left without paying my bill. I was out on the freeway and remembered. I thought, you know what? I could get away with this, but it wouldn't be a very good witness, would it? So I went back and paid. I probably just had coffee, but whatever. Um, but it was so exciting. And that, to me, was a miracle. Because after this event, uh, I had... Um, Roger, who was here also, who is, I showed, I showed some of you his old heart. My friend just had a heart transplant. He's lived in Fresno. And so I hooked them up, in, in, and then he got them into a good church and all this. Um, but after, after that event happened, and again, I have no idea how they got my name. Guess what? The minister who could do the wedding as a part of the package could do their wedding, and he did their wedding. I didn't even do the wedding. That was a divine appointment from God. And, like Rhoda, maybe that should be my nickname, I was so excited, you know, so excited. But God does these things, and then it's like, when, when he does them, then we're shocked. You know, I was so <laughs> shocked. I left without paying my bill. <clears throat> it's hard for us to get our minds around the miraculous when we see it. Because we live in a natural world. And 99.9999% of the time, we just see the world going about its natural course. And so when God does intervene, it's hard for us to process it and understand it. So, I, again, I would say, if you believe in it, if you expect it, then, I mean, I do give them credit. They finally did figure out, oh, it is Peter, and so God must have done something. God must have really heard and answered our prayers. Let me go on in verse 16. It says, But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. <laughs> but Peter with his hand, uh, put with, uh, but Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the brothers about this, he said, and then he left to for another place. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers. As to what had become of Peter, after Herod had a thorough search made for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. Then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there a while. He had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon, so they now joined together and sought an audience with him, having secured the support of Blasus, a trusted personal servant of the king. They asked for peace. Because they depended on the king's 
country, uh, yeah, uh, country for their food supply. <clears throat> on the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, this is the voice of a god, not a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God continued to increase and spread. Oh, that's one of the best passages in the Bible. I'm going to pray that that kind of thing would still happen today. <laughs> I, may have a name for my, I may have a name or two in mind. Uh, I don't know if they've ever claimed. Maybe we should say, you're a god, and see how they respond. There you go. There needs to be a clear distinction between God and not God. And there is no man, no matter how great they are, no matter what position they rise to, that should ever be equated with God. There is not a single person that has the power to do the supernatural or the miraculous. We can recognize that God working through us can do supernatural things, but it's never us. I, I, I think about the story where... Um, Peter and John are being praised because of some miraculous thing that they've done, and they're quick to say, hey, we are just men. That's, see, that's the right response. If, here's, I don't know, I have all my theories. This is a theory I have. I think that it's hard for God to use us sometimes to do miracles because we wouldn't handle it properly if he did. If somebody, we, I, I've seen people that are very gifted and anointed and it's very easy when they get praised for how gifted they are to begin to believe their own press, you know what I mean? To not be humble about it. You should be very humble. If, if, if God uh, chooses to work through you, you should be like, hey, it ain't me. I mean, did I share this here recently? Like the first time I ever preached, you know, I, I preached like 45 minutes and I guess I did a good job. And a guy came up to me and said, like, oh, that was really good. He goes, good thing God spoke through a jackass too, so, which is true. I mean, so, it doesn't, it, you know, that you might do a good job, but don't take the credit. Because he can use a jackass to say the same thing if he wants to. It's not you. You're not special. You're just being, you're just willing to be used. I, I have a feeling like that we don't see the miraculous as much is because we, maybe we wouldn't handle it properly. Like obviously here, King, King Herod did not handle it properly. When he got praised, he didn't say, hey, 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 it's not, you know, whatever good you see in me, it's not me. And he paid a great price for it. Um, We are not Christians as we claim to be, and we do not follow Christ in the model of Christianity we see it here if we do not believe in the miraculous, and that we should expect the miraculous and want the miraculous. Why, why do every prayer? Now, they were praying for Peter to be let out of prison, and we see how it happened. And we all acknowledge that that's miraculous. But every prayer that we pray is a request to God to intervene in the natural course of events in this world. Right? Because if we're going to leave it up to the natural events <laughs> to just unfold, then there's no need to pray. Right? Because it would just unfold as it naturally would. We only pray when we're asking God to do something to intervene in the natural course of events. <coughs> that, by definition, is miraculous. 
I prayed every night of my children's lives with them. Every one. Unless for some reason they were on a trip or something. I would, until they were, you know, 18 years old. And I'll tell you this too, for all of you, I tell you, I kissed my son on the lips goodnight every night until he was probably 16. Until his whiskers began to bother me. <laughs> I mean, it was it was a it was a pet. Don't get me wrong here, okay? But we prayed. We're praying. My kids, because of those prayers, they saw supernatural things happen. And today, because of that, they're not perfect, but they're pretty good kids. You know, Kate's our worship leader, Cassidy's an ordained minister. She believed when the doctor told her she would not have a baby without intervention, some medical thing. She believed, and of course Judy believed that she could, and she is. And God told Judy that Cassidy would hold a baby before her 30th birthday, and she will. Those are miraculous things. I can remember, I, should, I don't know what it is about the baby, but we all have planners for us. I mean, significant amount at times, but Kate and Cassie and I, and they were kids, and they had had, Cassie had had hers burn off and all this, they still, the furrows or whatever they do, and it, and it didn't work, she still had them. So you know what we did on those nightly prayers? We prayed. Now I know this is only planner's words, but when you see these open things on the bottom of your feet, and Kate had an area that was like the size of a quarter, just open, just a massive planner's words on the bottom of the feet. So, so I said, okay, it didn't work. They didn't, didn't, the doctor thing didn't work. I said, let's pray that they get that they're gone. So we prayed for Cassie's planner for us. And after about, I don't know, day five or whatever, I said, hey, let's look at your feet. It was nothing. Perfect skin. Perfect skin. And I thought to myself, I've had planner for for years. I thought, you know, I just had this sense because I've been praying for you. I wonder what mine looked like. I looked at mine and mine were gone too. So I told Kate, I said, hey, this is what happened with Cassie. Let's pray for yours. And so we did. And I don't know, day three, three or four days, we looked at Bonnie's feet. That the whole area, perfect skin, like they've never existed. Now I know it's just feet and planners works. It's no big deal. <coughs> but that's miraculous. My kids, <coughs> all prayer is praying for the miraculous. You need to understand that. And you're praying in what? We're told of what? The prayers offered in faith. If if we're praying and we don't believe in the miraculous, then there's no way to pray in faith. Because all prayer is asking God to do something supernatural, to intervene in the natural progress of this world. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? <coughs> Let me read this passage. I won't try not to comment on it too much, but it's, it's, it's really important. And the very last verse is the really the, the clincher. John 14, starting in verse 1. It says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that... Um, that you may also be where I am. Now, that's the heart of Christianity, right? We're going to go and be eternally with God. You know the place where I am going, where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you will know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that we will be, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, "Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such uh, such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I and the I am in the Father, and that the Father is in me? The words, the words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing this work. Now I'm going to stop right there." So Jesus is saying what? you got to believe all this. He, he's teaching them. He's telling them. He's explaining to them. 
Do they get it? Do they sound like they get it? Not really, right? Because they're still asking. Well, where are you going? What's the, what's the father look like? Can you show? I don't. They don't get it. Jesus explains it, but here's how he closes it. This is where it gets me. Verse 11, believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe the evidence of the miracles themselves. He's saying, if you're having a hard time understanding all this, explaining, you know, all the theology and doctrine or whatever all behind this, if you don't get all that so that you know that it's true, Think about it. You've seen me supernaturally intervene in the natural course of this world. If you don't understand anything else, understand that that doesn't happen unless God does it. And I'm the vehicle here doing, you know, I'm Jesus, I'm God, I'm present doing it. So at least, if you don't understand all the rest of this, at least believe the evidence of the miracles. Now, if Jesus told the 12 people who are closer to him than anybody else, if you don't understand all this Christianity doctrine I'm teaching you, at least believe the miracles. How can you possibly, no, Nicholas Kristoff, you can't possibly remove the miraculous from Christianity. I would say the large majority of American churches today would not, maybe they wouldn't reject it, but they've never thought, even thought about what I'm telling you here this morning. We have our form and our process and our procedure and our structure, and that's the way we do church. Okay, well, maybe that's the way you do church. And that's what, but you don't do Christianity. We were talking about this this morning in Sunday school. Christianity is not something I do. It's who I am. It cannot be separated. If I were to tell you about myself and what makes me me, I could not separate my faith out of that. It, it's not possible. Jesus Told, his, told people he wouldn't perform for them like some sideshow. No, I'm not going to do miracles for you like a sideshow. <coughs> but at the same time, he understood in this that there's value in seeing and recognizing and understanding miracles. No, I'm not going to perform for you like a trained monkey when he was asked, but he still understood there was value in, under, or in seeing and understanding miracles. At least believe the miracles. If Jesus is instructing his apostles to do that, how could you possibly remove the miraculous from Christianity? 1 Corinthians 2, verses 4 and 5. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. You guys have probably heard me read this so many times you're <coughs> by it. <clears throat> Again, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. What kind of power is that? Oh, you mean miraculous supernatural power? So that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. If our faith is to rest on God's power, <coughs> his supernatural miraculous power, then how can you possibly remove God's supernatural power and still have Christianity? Because that's what my faith is supposed to rest on. Am I making, it, am I making this up? I just read it to you, right? You saw the words up there on the screen? Your faith, at least let your faith, let your faith rest on God's power. This demonstration of God's power. Let me wrap this up. Romans 15, 18 and 19 says, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done, by the power of signs and miracles through the power of the Spirit, so that Jerusalem, all the way around to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. The, he is saying that he had not fully proclaimed the gospel until it included signs and miracles. It wasn't just the words. The complete proclamation of the gospel 
is, yes, teaching, and then putting that teaching into practice so that the supernatural and the miraculous takes place. That's the full preaching, the full declaration of the gospel. No, Nicholas Kristoff, you cannot remove the miraculous from Christianity and still have it be Christianity. Here's the good news for us. John 14, verses 12 through 14. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me of anything in my name and I will do it. Now, why am I saying, do I always see that happen? No, what I'm saying is this. We'll promise that we will do greater things. If you do not believe in miracles, you will probably not see a miracle. If you do not expect a miracle, you probably will never see miracles. What I'm saying today is that we have to orient our mind as a part of our faith. It's not about just, you know, um, the foundation of the gospel, like we're celebrating Christmas, the virgin birth, the resurrection, Easter, and be good in the meantime. Okay? Understanding Christianity is, is understanding, believing, and expecting as God has instructed us. The, the miraculous is a part of it. And that God, Jesus promised us that we are going to do what he did and do even greater things. If we do not believe in that passage, John 14, 12 through 14, about doing greater things, even it will not happen if we don't believe for it. If we do not understand it, if we do not accept that the miraculous is a key part of the Christian faith, then it cannot happen. God can't use us. He can't do that. It may say it, and it's true, but if we don't believe it, then it's not going to happen. And this is what I had written this, in, and I shared at the beginning. I just scribbled this in right before service started. I guarantee you people who, I guarantee people who believe in the miraculous are more likely to and will see more miracles. If you don't believe it, you're not going to see it. If we don't believe it, then John 14, 12 through 14 will not be filled through us. Let me close. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 19 says, But it is, if it is preached, <clears throat> but it, if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. As if, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, so there's another Nicholas Kristof note. More than that, we are then found to be a false witness about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him from the dead, in fact, that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. And all, uh, you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. If only in this life. What is he saying? Nicholas Kristoff, as I read in the beginning, he said, you know, I admire Christ. I admire Jesus. But I have a problem with the miraculous, things like the virgin birth and the resurrection. This right here, Paul is writing to the Corinthians, basically, if you do not believe in the resurrection, you cannot have Christianity. So the answer to Nicholas Kristoff is no. You can't have Christianity without the miraculous. Why? And I'm not accusing anybody of anything here, but I think we all have way too much time in our Christian faith when we are not thinking about Understanding, focusing on how we was it the miraculous when it is a critical part of our faith. I think most of us, myself included, we think of our Christianity as um, again the virgin birth, the resurrection, and in the meantime, try to be good, and then we'll go to heaven. Am I wrong? The miraculous, the supernatural, is an integral part of our faith. 
I'll add, again, Peter says, when he saw it, without a doubt, God just intervened supernaturally. I'd like to think that you know, we have times where we can say, yeah, without a doubt. <coughs> you know, and our faith is all we're built up because of that. It needs to be a part of our faith, without a doubt. And certainly this is a great time to remember it, the virgin birth. I, I was really excited at FCA, at Union's FCA group. I asked them, I read the passage about uh, Mary being a virgin and being a child. I read the whole passage and <clears throat> about the angel coming and all this. And I asked them, I said, what is the weirdest thing in this passage to you? What does it make, you know, and somebody said, the virgin birth. And I was like, yes, because that's not normal. Right? We all understand, even a bunch of high schoolers at FCA understand that doesn't happen ever. It's not possible, except that it did. Except that it did. It is critical. You can't remove that and still be Christian. Without a doubt, that's where we need to be. That's where we need to be in our faith, without a doubt.